Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee. We've got a hefty agenda to get through so um, I hope you bought your sandwiches to keep, keep you going. Um, so we'll get straight on with item one, uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Are we all happy that that's a true record? Councillor People? Um, can we have a seconder? Councillor Thurgood, thank you. Um, apologies for absence, uh, Joe. Uh, Councillor Andrew Cooper, are there any more? I think we're all here, aren't we? Yes. Okay. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. No, all happy. Okay. Straight on to item four then. The um, auditor's annual report and I'll hand you straight over to uh, Laura Lynn and Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll take the report because it's the it's, it's the last report I'll be showing to, to you. So, uh, and then I'll be handing over to Laureline. Before I, before I go into the report, uh, can I just take a moment just to introduce Laureline Griffiths? So, Laureline's a director in in my team based in Birmingham, and from here on in, she will become your engagement lead. Um, so, at the last committee, we discussed the uh, the auditor's annual report um, and uh, I said I'd be able to get it to this committee and uh, I'm pleased to, to have it here in front of you. Um, I'm not going to talk to all of the report, I'll, I'll talk to um, the, uh, the executive summary and just highlight what we found. Um, in, in my parlance this is a good uh, annual aud auditor's re report so th there's no um, significant weaknesses in, in here that we want to bring to the committee's attention. Uh, there are uh, you know, some improvement recommendations, but you know, this is the first year. Uh, I'd be surprised if there, if there weren't, you know, and uh, the council has responded positively to, to the areas that we, um, we've raised. Just talk, talking through, I'm on page three now, just talking through you know, e each of the key areas. So members will remember that we look at financial sustainability, we look at governance of the organisation, and then we look at sort of you know, what you're doing to uh, drive efficiency, economy, and effectiveness in the organisation. So, so financial sustainability, um, you know, I think we all recognise it's quite a challenging environment for local gov government. Single year settlements are never uh, that great in terms of long term planning. Uh, but I actually think, you know, as a council, you're in a good position. So you have quite a, a, a level of re reserves that are available to to, to you, um, and that that does place you in a in a strong financial position. My only note of caution is that you know um, you, you can see those reserves dissipating under the medium term financial plan. So, you know, I don't. I don't think the settlements are going to be that great for local government going forward, um, with the aside of probably education and social care. So you know, so, so what you do in terms of your savings plans and and how you you, you respond is quite is quite critical. Um, you do have a significant program in the in the reset and recovery program. I think that's that's a good program. How how you monitor that and how you make sure you're delivering those savings will be key to you know, to having a, um, a strong financial position going forward. Uh, but as we sit here today, you know, I'm, you know, I've got nothing really to, to kind of go, I'm particularly worried about. In terms of governance, we, you know, we look across all of, um, of what you do. So we look at, um, at the leadership team, we look at, um, uh, at cabinet, and we look at sort of, the, you know, the tone from the top all the way through to the audit committee, and then what, what you're doing in terms of, of risk management. Um, and, and in particular this year, we looked at how you responded to, to, to COVID. Um, you know, my view is that you're a well-governed council. You know, I'm sure there's areas uh, of, of improvement, but there's nothing uh, that I'm particularly wor worried about. There's nothing in terms of standards or, uh, or officer behaviour or member be behaviour, which, which I sometimes come across el elsewhere. You know, there's no kind of critical projects that I think are, are falling over. So there's nothing um, to flag to you in terms of, um, of governance. Just turning over the page, um, we get into a bit more depth around economy efficiency and effectiveness. And there are some areas just to um, just to flag to you here. And, and what we do is we look at, you know, do you have a, 
a council plan and then what are the performance arrangements in place and do you have sort of you know sufficient information coming to you to allow you to to understand um, you know how services are being delivered and procurement and so we look in quite a lot of depth at, at what you do um, I, I can see that there are um, our key key performance indicators in place I can see that um, that service plans um, are also in place uh, when we look at partnership we look at what the outcome com comes are so rather than you just having partnerships that don't don't really achieve anything but we, we could see in particular that the council had had successful partnerships that had led to an inflow of, um, of income into the council that had allowed you to uh, to meet some of your objectives so we were we, we were happy with that sort of overall process your your procurement process is is different you've made a deliberate decision to to sort of not have an overarching procurement strategy and you sort of manage it in a in, in a particular way that there's there's nothing wrong with that other than you do need to uh, get regular feedback on how that's going so and make sure that you know that those procurement pro processes are are effective um, so the issues that, that we flagged are, are when I looked at the uh, the KPIs, I, I didn't think they were that com comprehensive. So so I was a bit concerned that could, could you as members look at it for a, a service and form a view that they were, you know, that service was performing well or, or inadequately. So I do think there's a bit of work um, for you to do there. Um, we went through all the service plans. Uh, not all of them had been kept up to date. So so again, you know, the, the, the this is you saying, this is what we're going to deliver as a council and so it's important that at the start of the year you understand what those services are agreeing to actually deliver for you and then you've got, got the KPIs to, uh, to to monitor against. Now there was only a couple that weren't in, in place but I do think it's important that, that you have a, a whole suite of plans that cover everything that you do. Um, we looked at, um, at benchmarking, I think benchmarking has sort of lapsed a little bit over the years so so you're not kind of looking at benchmarking to go well are our services adequate what's it showing me in terms of things I could do differently so, so I think there's something to do um, or something for you to do around uh, using benchmarking um, a little bit more and um, we did do our own ben benchmarking and we sort of looked at um, we basically looked at, um, at sort of the level of reserves that, that, that you have. We also looked at, at your relative spend in comparison to uh, to other districts of, of a similar um, size. Um, as I said uh, earlier, I don't really have a problem with your reserves. So you've got, you've got a high level of reserves, which should help you as you saw, sort of um, move, move, move forward. So um, interestingly, you are a, a relatively high spending authority. When we look at that, we, we don't make a judgment that high spending is bad. What, what, what we look at is, is do you understand why you're a high spending authority and does that align with the priorities that you've set? So, so And that's the, the challenge we've put to, to management. Management have come back and said, look, we're, we're comfortable with this. We know why the, those areas, there's like tour tourism is an area in particular where, where where you've focused on and where your expenditure is perhaps higher than than the average um, but I you know the, this is as well as reporting on your on you as a council this is there for information for you so you as members need to become comfortable that where you are high spending that you understand that and that does fit with your your priorities as well um, the council have responded really positively to um, to, to things that, that, that we've said. Um, you know, there's an acknowledgement that care KPIs do need to be improved and that service plans need to be um, brought, brought up to date. Uh, I think fairly management have gone. You know, the, it was a COVID year, so you know, so you know, it's um, it was difficult to to make sure everything um, was in place. And then you know, there's a review of. Uh, the performance management framework and there's a review of the commercialization strategy so so you know so some areas to to look at but overall uh, it, as i said at the beginning i'm satisfied with where the council is and there's no significant weaknesses that we've identified from our review i'm going to pause there chair so hopefully i've given you a good summation of the report i'm more than happy to take any questions that members have thanks mark um, obviously, we, we in the pre-meet, I've, I've asked a lot of my questions, but um, 
Andrew, did you want to just give us the update on the question I asked around the service plan so that all members are aware what we've what we've put on put in place what Mark's just discussed because some of them were missing. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I I contacted Andrew Barrett in relation to that question around service plans and Andrew has, has confirmed back that obviously we are in the process of overhauling um, our service planning arrangements and obviously and following adoption of the new corporate vision and the, and the corporate plan that will feed into the service, service planning processes going forward. Thank you Chair. Thanks Andrew. And the other one was um, around um, 2025 20, 26 mark long term can you just give us some more information on on your views on if we should be concerned and and why going forwards thank you chair um i i think every local authority needs to be concerned about its finances you know you're you know, as i said i think you have a, a decent level of reserve so i'm not sat here going you know, you've, you've got a problem from from now, you know, and you, you have the Reset and Recovery program in place. What you have to do is make sure you deliver it. So, you know, and, you know, while you do doing that, you need to keep an eye on, on what the government settlement is going to be and whether that settlement is a year or three years, then is going to make it, you know, potentially problematic for you if it's another one-year se settlement. I... I, you know, th there's too many things going on in the global economy that are going to impact on us, aren't, aren't there? So, you know, um, whether it's sort of, you know, build costs, you've got a significant capital program, whether it's energy costs, so, you, you know, all, all of that needs to be funded. You know, will the government be able to afford all of that? So, alongside everything else it's trying to, to achieve. So, so you're, you're in a relatively good position. The task, I think, is to is for you to sort of make keep an eye on finance so that you remain in that position. Thanks, Mark. Are there any further questions? Simon. Thanks, Chair. Um, <coughs> the previous meeting we've noted that some actions are not being responded to when recommendations, when internal audit uh, draw up those recommendations. Is there a correlation between the areas without service plans and those that are not implementing recommendations? I can't remember which services they, they were. In, in this report, um, sorry, from, from internal audit, in the report we highlight uh, two plans, I'm just trying to get there, so that weren't in place. Uh, let me see if I can find them. There is uh, there's the environmental health plan, which I, I think very very much related back to um, to COVID. So the the conversation that I had was that um, you know that team had just been fo focusing on COVID, so it, so that's why it hadn't updated the the plan. Uh, there was uh, leisure serv services, uh, which had old data, technical information services. Uh, and um, asset service plan. So, so those were the areas. So, I don't think they directly uh, collate to what internal audit had. But I'm going to I'm going to look at Andrew and see whether see what he has to say. No, it doesn't. It doesn't collate to that we've done as as internal audit. But obviously, that's something that obviously we we need to look at and take forward. I think that that we need to obviously have a look at service planning. Uh, Chair, I wasn't actually asking whether it collated with that. At the last but one meeting, I think, the one before you became Chair, um, we'd highlighted that there were uh, recommendations which were not being implemented after internal audit inspections um, and that they were beginning to pile up. You'd been doing your best to get the total number down, but the age of some of those recommendations was noted to be quite long that you know not everything from three months earlier had now been done so I'm just asking whether you would have a look through you chair at as to whether some of the same departments that haven't been doing plans have also not been following up on recommendations because I would be concerned that if 
if a department isn't planning and isn't following up on recommendations, then those departments would be pushing themselves towards the top of next year's internal audit plan. Um, so, so that that was particularly what I was uh, asking about. And apologies for not having expressed it clearly. Can I just challenge you on the environmental health? I'm a bit concerned that COVID becomes the the, the reason that everybody can use. Co it, the environmental health we were fortunate and got support for and got very large additional amounts of funding considering the size of the team you know in in general terms so we had some additional posts that were fully funded during that period so although there was a good deal of additional work there was also additional resource now it's, it's not always the case that extra work brings additional resource but it did in this case um, and I remember on several occasions getting phone calls on behalf of a local charity from members of EHO asking about whether we were paying for the daily uh, annual licence for the castle grounds. Now, I, I was struggling to understand why. If they were run off their feet doing everything to do with COVID, they had time to ring us up to ask for £42 or whatever it was. And I'd, So then when I'm told the plans weren't being done, I'm thinking to myself, is the plan not being done because they were given a short-term target to get people to pay for events they couldn't hold? Um, or or was it really that they weren't on, on uh, unable to keep up? Now, I'm, I'm not saying COVID didn't create extra work, but we had extra whole posts funded. So I am questioning, if you like, whether that can be used as a blanket excuse on this one. It's a good question, Councillor, and, and that... That was management's explanation. I, I, it doesn't sort of automatically um, connect that I accepted that recommendation. No. The explanation. So, so my view is that um, you should have had a service plan for all of these with up-to-date da data, including environmental health, because if they were off doing COVID, then you you needed to sign that that off. You needed to own that as a, as a council and go. What we're going to do is have our environmental um, health people people working on COVID so that means that this that and what whatever goes so you know so I, I think you've probably made my point better than I can you know the, it, it is crucial that you have these plans because you need to understand what your people are doing and what decisions are making because because you may have made a different decision you may have gone well no we, we, we want them out doing environmental health work as well as doing COVID work you know, and then you get a better, you know, talking, you're talking about additional posts, you then understand where that money's going, and you can, you know, the, these are decisions that you, you need to make and prioritise, and there needs to be a conversation between you and officers, so, so yeah, I, I'm with, with you, a service plan ought to have been in place, and COVID, while I think it's a valid comment, is not necessarily, you know, the, the right way to, to, to go, it's not an excuse for not having a plan, you you do need a plan for whatever you're doing so that you can measure what the outcomes are. Thank you. Um, I've got um, Councillor Michelle Cook next, but what I should have done is introduce you all to Councillor Michelle Cook at the start because she's new to this committee, back off maternity leave from having the lovely Athena. So welcome, Michelle. Sorry I didn't mention that at the start, and you're free to ask your question. Thank you very much, Councillor Clements. Um, yeah, no, hi everyone. Um, so my question is just kind of um, going on from what Councillor People was um, asking about kind of service plans and the notes that, um, shall we say, we've got some quite high, while well, we are overall a, a high spending authority. Do you, any of the places where we've got kind of l lack or not particularly detailed service plans or out of date service plans correlate with areas of high spend, i.e. Is it areas that we've set as a, a council as a priority that we're not updating, or is it? And I know I don't mean to kind of say, is it our top kind of priority areas that haven't got them, or is it those that may not be as high spending? I is it the add-ons, or is it the kind of the meat of what we do? I did, I did. It's a good question again. So, so, so some of it does collate. So, so environmental and regulatory services. So that that's high spend. So that and that was an area that didn't have an up to date service plan. Uh, the other areas were, were areas like community safety, 
So, and then um, defences against flooding, which, you know, I'm not sure how much flooding you actually get, sort of, uh, so, and then safety ser services. So, uh, um, so, but environmental health definitely collates. So, between not having a service plan and being high spend. Okay, that's um, really interesting. In that case, three yourself, council attempts the chair, can we ask for that to be kind of added to either kind of the next meeting or a work plan um, to actually have that drill down a little bit more and actually get kind of a through yourself, Andrew, in terms of actually getting an idea of exactly, or Lynn, um, exactly what is planned and actually getting that kind of fixed as quickly as possible, or at least a position so we, we're, we're comfortable because I think you're right <laughs> that it is something that should happen and as councillor people has also said the covid and i use the word excuse it's not an excuse there's been an awful lot that's happened <laughs> but there's always going to be something that's happening and i think when you look at some of the other things that have slipped as well um through the last 12 months it's actually saying let's keep a real finger on that button and make sure that when things do change that council is aware of that and I'm Lynn I'm sure you're probably going <laughs> to say I mean you, you I know more than anyone that probably you do keep your foot on people's throats to say do it but actually yeah that's kind of what we're not not literally <laughs> but, but metaphorically speaking to make sure we're doing that but I think just to bring that back to the committee and keep us updated or whoever's sitting here in May. Lynn did you want to just come in I wondered what Michelle was going to say I thought she was going to say break on somebody's necks then but she changed it very quickly I don't think I'm tall enough to get my foot on anybody's neck anyway <laughs> if I could I know we've had a significant amount of funding for or additional funding for the environmental health team because of the Covid pressures the problem there was so did every other council and there wasn't the environmental health officers out there to be able to bring them in to do the work and then they got to the position where they actually they could demand their own salary so prices went up which just sort of like escalates the problem all the time doesn't it but I am aware that they are looking at things and they've got a service plan to carry some of the funding forward to start afresh in April thank you Simon did you want another question well I'll just point out again um, if we're funding posts to do admin then for EHOs to ring up charities asking for their castle grounds annual fee strikes me as the question about whether the priority was going where it should have done. And that's, I, I mean, it's a problem, I know, because, you know, we're real people and we're involved in things and we see the council not in the smart strategy paper scenario sometimes, but in the day to day. And, you know, when you get calls saying, can you pay that? 40 quid for that event which you can't actually hold because of covid but you have to pay it in order to hold on to that slot in the annual calendar then that suggests to me that revenue maximization was coming ahead of whatever else had to go on and also bear in mind that that's the department that would have been responsible for overseeing why the pub opened at 6 a.m on the first day after lockdown leading to very poor headlines and very damaging things so you know if they've got time to ring up for that i'm questioning why that time wasn't being devoted to things which were damaging to the town that doesn't mean if every individual officer wasn't doing their best to try and manage these things because we're all the same we all have to manage priorities but you know i'm just thinking to myself as the carnival committee we were told you know if you you can't have the carnival but you still have to pay for your slot if time can be devoted to chasing that and not chasing down publicans who are not registering, not doing this, not doing that, and are then opening at 6 a.m. in order to sell alcohol, leading to a fight at 8 p.m. in the evening and the police and all the national headlines, um, then I don't think the priorities are properly understood, or at least not as I would understand them as a member of the public. So th that that's my point. And, and you know, if they hadn't got a service plan, then perhaps that says something about what we need to do going forward. Um, that with regard to the spending, I think it's perfectly reasonable that in something like tourism we may well be a high spender because no, not every authority of our size has a castle. you know. <laughs> and, and if you take the castle as a net sort of quarter of a million a year, um, then you know 
we are going to be high spending for a district council. We, you know, we will push ourselves up, and and in that sense, I take your point. It sometimes is is fine. The procurement policy bothers me more, or the absence of it. And I and I've raised this not under the heading of consultants because I know some past leaders of the council used to throw that at their successors and then have it thrown back at them <laughs> because everybody's used consultants but it does concern me that we take on consultants for one project and then they they they're cited as the consultants for another project and another project after that and i'm left thinking you know are we really looking hard enough at what we're doing and the other thing the absence of procurement policy seems to have led to is no one's prepared to ask about local content in the way that they really should. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, we used to be given the excuse, which wasn't true, but you know, it was an excuse that European regulations meant we had to, you know, advertise throughout the country and et cetera, et cetera, and the world. Um, but in practice, you only had to go abroad to see that actually that wasn't the case, and that when they advertised local French markets to be operated, they had a local content. We don't seem to be doing that, and it and it bothers me. And then the other thing is you mentioned partnership services procurement and how that had brought in money. I am still not convinced that our legal services arrangement is generating the quality of advice that we need. We're having to put anything major out for um, independently. So, you know, big stuff goes out because we have to. And therefore, what are we getting out of it? And I'm getting local decisions which are reported to me, which then, when I inquire from officers, we find the advice we've had isn't correct or isn't, well, sustained in court anyway. So I'm questioning, can local authorities procure a decent level of service using in-house lawyers because of the competition for lawyers and the costs it's not, I mean, I'm not against the concept of an in-house service, but all the reports we get back are saying, do you know what, we can't get the staff, or if we get them, we can't keep them because, you know, commercial property is now on the up and this, that, and the other's on the up. And these people, if they're any half, half decent, you know, they're, they're off to another job. So I, I would question whether that area of procurement is working. You know, I, I know what you're saying. You're probably alluding to domestic waste contract. You know, fair dues, um, as long as we don't end up in a mess because the accounts don't match the way Litchfield present this. But, it, you know, leaving that one aside, are we getting good value for money? The principle of working together is a good thing, but are we big enough to get the kind of legal system we need or should we be looking at to procure that? Or, or should that be something the Audit and Governments Committee should be looking at for the future to review the procurement of? Sorry, that's rather a long question. You're very kind to me, Chair. It is my last meeting, so at least next meeting you think, well, he won't be here. <laughs> and neither will I care, Councillor. So it's like, uh, it's our last time. Well, the quality is so. going to be different, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. See, I said different. I didn't say up or down. <laughs> and probably won't have someone else either. So, so well, there you go. <laughs> it's change. Change always change. So, uh, so I, I just start thinking, so, so I completely recognise your, your point on tourism. That That's why... When we see benchmarking, we we present the figures to you and go, you know, is this right? Do you recognise this? And and I think uh, we we recognise why you're high spend on tourism as well. So, but it, it's it's right just to, to flag that. In terms of procurement, it, it is probably the area where um, you're most outside of what I would see as the norm in terms of of how you approach it. So now. You know, when we looked at it and we could see a lot of things that were happening that we thought were, were appropriate. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with, with what you do. But I do I do think you need to get a little bit more granular in terms of your monitoring of procurement and sort of the suppliers that, that, that you're using. So, you know, and I think officers accept the recommendations that we've made. So, so hopefully we'll see um, a change as we you know, when we come back to, to, to have a look at that. In Chair, terms can I just ask, when you say they've indicated they accept, if we're that far out of the norm, that would mean a rather a big culture change? Have, have they really endorsed the idea of doing it differently, or are we just being told that they're cooperating with you? 
I, I, I didn't sense a reluctance, but neither did I, you know, I, I don't think, I think officers think the, the processes are good enough. And, and I don't disagree. I just think they could be better. So I think you could have better procurement processes. So that's that's that that's the whole aim of this work is to kind of go look. We we know what you're doing, but we think you know, given given the how much particular capital money is coming into local government. So you know, so we think that you know there's probably more that you can do. You know, in terms of how you monitor and con contract and so on. So so you know but officers you know from my perspective have accepted what we've said and they've responded appropriately within this report can, can i just ask what an example would be of what we're different how are we different if you see what i mean so the main one is that you don't have a formal procurement strategy so so i would you know no, normally when i go to a place and say you know give me your procurement strategy there's a very you know, it's it's very standardised. So so you know, th this is our procurement strategy. We're going to outsource le legal. So we're going to, um, you know, a anything over a certain value. We're going to sort of have it member approved and so on. So it, it's quite standardised in terms of of the approach. Now, you've taken a different approach to to to, to that. So you know, in all of these things, wh what we look look at is whether it it works. So, because you know, just because it's different, doesn't matter that much. What matters is whether it works. So, and there's nothing fundamentally wrong. The areas that I'd like you to do more on are, are areas like, you know, do more monitoring of contracts. So, do more monitoring of, of particular suppliers, so that you're secure in that procurement. So, so I think there are things that you could do slightly differently, but there, there's nothing that's fundamentally wrong. Okay. Um, in terms of legal, and then I'll Lynn's dying to come in. Sorry, Lynn. So, uh, so in, in terms of legal, it, it, it's the same with any service. So you, and where it could be legal, it could be you know HR, it could be any sort of back office service. the The decision is whether you can afford to buy the value that you need. So, and if you can't do that individually, then you need to look at whether you can do that in partnership as you have in waste so with another authority so you can get the value and the expertise that you need in what's going to become a um, you know a highly competitive market Lynn sorry if I may chair yeah in regards to a couple of the points that Mark's raised there, although we don't have a strict procurement strategy and he's raised the concern there about what value of contracts come to members, they are actually outlined and strict rules are within our own financial regulations as to exactly which contracts are seen by members and approved by members. The other thing to add is that over the last 12 months we have now taken on a quarterly report that goes to corporate management team on the activities of procurement, picking up the issues that are we um, doing all the correct monitoring that we should be doing, what's coming up in the pipeline next, trying to get to a point that we know from a procurement point of view what's actually coming in and what are the big ones. On a plus side, I've had um, Sarah McGrandall, Assistant Director of Operations Leisure today, phone me and say, thank goodness we were on the ball with the um, re-procurement of the street scene vehicles because now Ford have closed their books as well so that's Ford, Procu um, Peugeot and I think there were two others so had we not been on the ball and known what we've got to do and we're, we're talking 12 months in advance on that one we could have been a, left ourselves in a quite a sticky situation so although we don't have a strict strategy I think in the background because as Mark says we're looking at all sorts of things and reporting them to the corporate management team we're holding it together at the moment is probably the best way to put it. Thanks. Chair, in response to that, can I make a suggestion that in the way that some other reports that are quarterly then come to scrutiny, I would have thought that if there's a quarterly corporate management or report quarterly to corporate management on the monitoring of contracts, then that ought to come to audit. I, I mean, I'm suggesting that for people who aren't here, but when I won't be here, but, but but from a practical point of view, if members are actually going to have an overview of that, then 
and and this committee already has a confidential session at the end with auditors so it wouldn't be difficult to then simply make that the last item beforehand so that it protected its confidentiality but but I, you know if the report's there members ought to know about it i think that's a practical and certainly it's not a reason not for members not to be told <laughs> Can I just ask then, Chair, with regard to the asset strategy, um, we have had several meetings where the asset strategy was mentioned and then it's not happened and it's not happened again. And I had a recent meeting where um, there was one particular potential asset that was discussed and, and um, then I was asked by a group to contact them to see if we could visit it. And I contacted the assistant director and the assistant director said, yes, of course, no problem, X will organize that for you. Uh, nothing happened. So I contacted them again and uh, the email went to an over full box. Um, and then um, the next thing was, I, I took it up again and I was told someone else was dealing with it. And about seven or eight weeks later, I've still not heard anything. Now I'm not saying that that's make or break on that particular development, but I think it, underlines the problem we have we don't have an asset strategy we don't have people going out saying i want to let this or i want to do that and i think it underpins that point that we don't have a strategy so i think that's why it's really important that that strategy gets in place because then someone would be saying well hang on we said we do this with this site what's happened <laughs> you know and it's not about i'm not saying what should happen with that site but one reason why it's sat empty for six or seven years is probably because there isn't a strategy to do something with it. So I think that's something to take out of the report. Any further questions, members? No? Anything further to add? No? All good? Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Laura Lynn. Thanks, Lynn. Laura Lynn. Lynn. Um, so if we're all happy with... Um, the annual report and the recommendations throughout the report on what they've picked up. Um, are we all happy for that to uh, go forward? All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. And thank you, Mark. Um, and good luck in whatever you're going to be doing in future. We won't see you. I might not be here either, but there you go. Who knows? Change. All change okay. it could be in May. Uh, Um, or is it just an acceptance? It's just, uh, we can ask for a mover and a seconder if you, I don't think we've ever done it before, but we can if you wish to. We normally do, Chair, it's just normally Martin would sort of pick up the first two hands he saw come forward and take okay, them as so mover and seconder. Does somebody want to move it then? Well, if you're looking to move, I'll second. Michelle Cook moving it to second, and second it, it and Simon People seconds it, yay. <laughs> Okay, we'll move uh, we'll move swiftly on to um, item five, which is um, informing the audit risk assessment. Lynn, no, no, Laura Lynn, Lynn, La I'm getting confused today. It's close enough. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this uh, this document is part of our risk assessment and planning for the coming uh, financial statements audit. So the external audit of the twenty one twenty two financial year. Um, we bring this document to audit committee each year. Uh, it's a series of questions that we have asked of management and it contains management's responses um, and we're presenting it to you just to sort of check that the responses that we've been given are consistent with your understanding of how things work at the council um, and in particular to check whether you're aware of any frauds or litigations that are not disclosed in the document. Um, I wasn't planning to run through it in detail, but if anyone does have any questions, I'm sure between me and Lynn, we can probably answer them. Thanks, Laura Lynn. We have all had it and it's quite lengthy. So are there any questions on um, on that report that's been done for us, the in, um, audit risk assessment? We went through it at the pre-meet and couldn't find anything, could we at all? And he's much better than me, so... Um, so if there are no questions... Oh, Simon? Sorry, Chair. Um, can I just check, and it's, I want to refer to this appropriately, um, the potential litigation that was pending after the completion of the Assembly Rooms. Is that covered? I'm just trying to remember. Apologies, I didn't put enough juice in my laptop, so I was just going to check back. 
Lynn, did you want to come in? Just going to say it's still an ongoing issue at this point. It's not been settled in any way yet. Thanks. And therefore, the auditors are aware. Yeah. That's, that's why I just wanted to confirm because I would have thought that was potentially the, the one that differed most from the original report. Thank you. Okay, if we're all happy, can we have someone to move that report? Moira Gretrix, someone to second? Michelle Thurg uh, Michelle Thurgood, Michelle Cook. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know her dad's got rid of her once. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the um, item six, the final accounts plan, accounting policies, and the action plan. Chair, I think Joe wants to. Sorry, yeah, just a vote on item five. Yeah, that's carried, sorry. Final accounts plan. Uh, accounting policies and action plan number six. That's you, Lynn. That's me, Chair. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, the purpose of this report is just to outline the corporate requirements that we'll have in order to be pull the Council's annual statement of accounts together for 21-22. There are actually five recommendations on the report. The first is that the proposed accounting policies for 21-22 as attached to Appendix A are approved. Just to say that there are no real changes this year from what they were last year, but it is considered good practice to report them to auditing governance each year. Having said that, I did just want to raise at this point that in January, SIPFA, the accounting body for local authorities, issued a consultation paper on emergency proposals for an update to the 2122 code, and he eventually decided to explore two options further. The first being the changes to the code to allow local authorities to pause professional valuations for operational plant, property and equipment for a period of up to two years. And the second being deferring the implementation of IFRS 16 leases for a further year. I think that one's been deferred on a number of occasions already. Um, however, as the cons closing date for the consultation was not until early March, left it a little bit late for us as officers to try and suddenly get assets valued if the decisions weren't not upheld. Um, the council's valuation programme has already been underway since early January, so we've continued with that, which has been um, a relief to find out that late last week the results were announced from the consultation paper which recommended that neither of the options should be adopted. So had we waited, we could have been in a little bit of a pickle. The second recommendation is that the target date of the 30th of June for the closure of the final accounts and the production of the statement for 21-22 be approved. The statutory de deadline for this activity is actually the 31st of July, so we're aiming to try and get it done a little bit early, which gives us a little bit of scope should things slip anywhere. Um, the annual plans for the production of the statement of accounts for recent years have been reviewed and we've looked at and can be to make sure they can be produced before the deadline of the 30th of June. And the key issues affecting these achievements in the previous year are shown at Appendix B. Our third recommendation is that staffing resources be committed to the provision of the appropriate information and support in order to meet the publicised timescales and committee receive progress updates if required. Um, Appendix C highlights the main information required from the other services, so this is not just about finance department, that will need to be supplied in order to meet the deadlines. Recommendation four is that CMT corporate management team receive a fortnightly update until the completion of the audit. We will review key milestones and dates by the finance team and these will be reported and any proposed remedial actions again reported to CMT. And finally, the fifth recommendation is that the statement be presented to this committee before the end of September 2022, which is in line with the statutory um, deadlines at the moment. But it has to be said that between the issuing of the draft statement at the end of June and the conclusion of the audit at the 30th of, at the end of September, there is an awful amount of work that has to be done both by finance officers and the um, external audit team to enable us to get to that position. We have determined that this year we will all be on site for that period of the on-site audit so it won't, we won't be trying to do it by teams because we've decided that actually it would be a lot easier and a lot better for officers and external auditors to be sat face to face. Happy to take any questions. Thanks Lynn. Um, the only one I asked of you as you remember was the recommendation three on staffing resources um, and I think we discussed that um, 
there could be some um, resources around payments um, but you think you said you were going to just move people around to do the job they need to do oh, did not switch myself off sorry yes um, we've reviewed as I say the timetable and a lot of the um, working papers and areas that I previously covered have now been allocated to a new member of staff and I've been training them for the last three months to make sure that the skills are there yeah and obviously the biggest risk issue we've got is that you're leaving us too so uh, um, yeah so that comes as a big risk so Lynn is leaving us as well um, any further questions Simon thanks chair um, with regard to the um, new working arrangements and everything being based on people being at home and then only coming in on certain days and then from what you're saying you might need to rearrange all of that um, are you confident that you can do that given you know, that we have just in the process of asking people to base themselves at home and work remotely so and come in only on certain times so that was just the practicalities of managing that against what we've just asked the staff to agree to if i might as part of the smart working project of recovery and reset it was highlighted that during that on-site audit period um, finance staff and potentially some other staffs in other service departments would need to be in and be available to the external auditors so yeah we've already considered that going forward thanks any further questions no are we happy to take those five recommendations on block uh, so um uh, Councillor Richard Cook and yourself to agree on the process. <laughs> well, Richard Ford spoke first on moving, so All do you right. want to second Simon? Oh, go on then. Go on then, you know you want to. <laughs> so moved by Councillor Ford, seconded by Councillor People. All those in favour before I get shot by Joe. That's carried, thank you very much. So we'll move um, straight on to item seven, which is reset and recovery update. Now, Tina Mustafa was meant to be here tonight, but unfortunately... Tina is poorly so uh, over to you Lynn now be careful be gentle with Lynn if she hasn't got the answer she will come back to you thank you chair I was going to start out by saying not sure that I'll be able to answer many questions on this so I will take them back to Tina and she's agreed that she'll either do a written response to the individual member or to all of you depending on what's required um, she's highlighted in her brief papers that she sent to you which um, scrutiny boards and the scrutiny committees and the board oversight, so which parts of the recovery and reset go to which corporate scrutinies, and I think that's been going on since January, so I think we're all aware of that one. The, program, the, go, the report then goes into the risk areas, and she's asked me to raise three key risks with you. The first one being the budget, and that's been quite difficult, and we're trying to ensure that we stay within the financial envelope going forward, and in light of other issues we've already spoken of tonight building costs and energy costs going up that one is going to be crucial the second risk is the building and what are we actually end up as a council in the offices the, and what's happening with the current market conditions they are moving quite fast at the moment so we need to keep an eye on that one and the third one is the time scales these are particularly tight at the moment linked to number one and number two we need to make sure we just keep moving forward happy to try and answer any questions <laughs> thanks Lynn obviously I raised the issue um, at our pre-meet about the rising fuel costs and rising costs of building materials as we all know um, and obviously um, Tina sent that out in the uh, in her uh, brief before tonight's meeting so has anybody else got any questions Simon Thank you, Chair. Um, with regard to the report, it suggests that, as I as I read it, um, I, it suggests that there is no building in the council's ownership in the town centre that would be suitable. Is it correct that a potential building in the council's ownership that is in the town centre has been discussed at Executive Board? As far as I'm aware, there are a number of options of potential properties that we own that have been included in the discussions, and I'm not sure we've come down to a final short list of buildings at this stage. Perhaps, Chair, if you wish, I'll pursue that one after we 
move to the the, the final item but I, I i i'm a bit concerned that my understanding is different to the exact wording not necessarily the implication but the you know the dif the difficulty is if it says there is no the risk is high because there's no alternative building but actually we are discussing buildings in our own ownership then i think it, it's just perhaps the nuance is is missing from from that but i mean it's not lynn's report so <laughs> no clearly not ever but but um perhaps uh, once we discuss that in confidential i'll um we could agree on a question then going back it, i think that'd be the best way to do it because otherwise i'm going going to be either unable to say something or say the wrong thing in in public thank you any further questions M michelle thank you yeah just a quick one based on kind of the, the um shall we say um emphasis that we're putting on reset and recovery um within the budget going forward it's just i'd love to see i know from, obviously from tina would be able to give us chapter and verse on it but in terms of the actual risk management a little bit more um nailing down of when we expect to see this becoming clearer so like things like what we've just said there about the um kind of lack of building etc at the moment it's open-ended in terms of i know there's obviously conclusion dates within the actual kind of well when we're expecting to see things happen but actually from our perspective based on what was said earlier about monitoring kpis etc actually having it within the mitigations of when we expect to see that nailed down um from a point of because at the moment it's open-ended are we going to get to april march or april may june july and be told oh actually no, there's no alternative it's c the fact that we need those savings to be seen realized i don't want to be sitting here in six months time to be told actually we can't do what we were anticipating so to see that in a little bit more detail i know that will be happening behind the scenes but again from a transparency perspective we need to be confident as a committee that we're not going to sit here because that the 3.93 million black hole that we're facing in a few years it's coming ever closer every single day and if we're not planning well we are planning for that but if we're not if that's not possible we need to be able to see it so i think happy to kind of if you take it back to tina or we pick it up separately just to go when's the kind of it must be done by if i can just add to that yeah. as part of the budget process for the 2022-23 five-year uh, medium term for financial strat strategy i can't get any words out tonight um, there is nearly three million pounds worth of recovery and reset um, savings included in the policy changes so these savings have already been made and the budgets have actually been removed from 2022-23 so then we will be monitoring against those reduced level of budgets going forward in the new financial year. Thank you. Any further questions, Simon? Chair, can I just come back on, on the the issue that I think Councillor Cook's rightly focused on, which is that these we've been told in other scrutinies that we're looking at June, July for a decision on future because if it isn't by June, July, it'd be difficult to actually move everybody and be in the new place in time to hit the deadline. And I think that's the critical point. When the auditors earlier said about, you know, the tough bit will be nailing the budget that we've set rather than, you know, having come up with it, <laughs> getting it done. Um, so I think that's why it's critical that we do understand, well, if there is an option within our own ownership and if that means we can move within the timeline, then that begins to secure what are essential savings and what, what's not been made explicit thus far, but it is, is general knowledge, it's not um, political. Um, and that is that if there is a three-year settlement, it's anticipated that the, the balance between unitaries and districts will be rebalanced and it won't be to district council's favour because of the high pressure on education to recover from COVID and social care, which as we all know, is a is a massive area of concern. And you as county councillors will know that, but from the other side of the fence. So that's why it's so critical that we can nail down some of these savings as soon as we can, because if they don't happen in year two or three, as per the plan, then year five just disappears out of reach. 
So that that's why it's really useful if we can have some hard information on that, I think. Come come certainly for you to have that by June, July, I think would be critical. You're happy to take that take that battle in, yeah? Yeah, I'll take that one back to Tina. Thank you. I think yeah, it's quite and important Stephen that we yeah, and Stefan, yeah. Thank you. Any Chair, Chair, could we agree that that comes to the committee rather than just to one person? Because yeah, I think so we've all collectively asked the question, where yeah. are we up to? So that will come out to, to all members of this committee, uh, Lynn, if that's possible. All happy with that, yeah? Any further questions? No? Okay. So just go back to what the recommendations are. Uh, the recommendations are all in the report. So are we um, we all happy with the report um, and for Lynn to take back what we've discussed? Can we have a, a mover for that report then, please? Michelle, Moira to second, thank you. All those in favour? Fab. Just wait for my laptop to decide what it's going to do. Um, it's just, uh, so, it's so slow, honestly, I, I feel like throwing it out the window. Um, so item eight then is the inter internal audit plan and charter 22-23. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to present my report on the draft internal audit plan and charter for 2022-23 for comment and endorsement by the committee. This is an annual report to committee which outlines the proposed work of internal audit during the forthcoming financial year. The consideration and endorsement of an effective audit plan and charter is an important element in providing assurance to the Council that arrangements are in place to provide an independent and objective opinion on the adequacy of the internal control environment. I have outlined the proposed audit plan in Appendix 1 of this report and the draft plan has been prepared in discussion with assistant directors and executive directors whose comments have been incorporated into the planning process. I've also reviewed the current risks facing the Council and adapted the plan accordingly to ensure coverage in particular areas around IT risks. <laughs> and this assessment takes into account the previously reported IT audit needs assessment which I reported to this committee on 28th of October 2021. In addition, I've reviewed previous audit assurance work together with the level of resources to deliver the planned work. These discussions have included the input from the Council Section 151 officer. The number of audit days, 269, maintains on par with fellow authorities and is sufficient resource to provide objective assurance over the Council systems. I have outlined in my report the Council's ad adoption of the three lines of defence model of assurance, which we also use as a basis in audit planning. I would like to highlight to the committee that we will continue to main an overview of both Recovery Reset Programme and also Future High Street Fund. In addition, I'd like to highlight that we will also carry out further assurance work on the grants awarded by the to the Council and, be and also provide assurance in relation to ensure that's on a risk-based approach. Additional areas of work will also include assurance work on disabled facilities grants and also pensions. The plan, as I previously indicated, has been discussed and agreed by corporate corporate management team. I would also like to highlight to the committee that during 2022-23, we will also need to undertake an external assessment of the internal audit service to, be, to comply with the public sector internal audit standards. And I'll work through the quality assurance processes to ensure that we are prepared for this assessment. This assessment is carried out on a five-year basis and reviews internal audit service against the public sector internal audit standards and reports on our compliance with those. I will obviously keep the committee appraised of both the process and also the results of that, of that inspection. I've also included the audit, audit charter and this has minor changes highlighted in yellow within the appendix two of the report. I'm more than happy to take any questions that the committee may have. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody got any questions? Uh, Simon? Thank you, Chair. Um, we've heard tonight that the area where we're most away from the norm is on capital monitoring and spending. Do you think there's enough time devoted in this report to that, bearing in mind that for the next two years, because of the amount of money that we've 
got from the government that probably our capital spending will be higher than it's been since we had, you know, grants to build the Amington and, and Glasgow estates. <laughs> you know, the, the sheer volume of money involved and, and the potential um, given, you know, I mean, even if we didn't have rising prices and energy costs, the truth would be it'd be a lot of money to keep track of and, and to do well. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether if the audit report says most of your internal systems are actually pretty sound, we could have more time devoted to monitoring the capital rather than the, the daily revenue expenditure, which is not you know, not apparently an issue. So I'm, I'm using the external report to, to inform my view of the, the internal audit plan. Mark, did you want to come in on that before I bring Andrew in? Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I, you know, in terms of how how I perceive risk for the authority, then it's not around your day-to-day -day expenditure. So it's around the the capital programs that you have, you know, and the uh, the towns fund, and around sort of you know what happens with the college. So it's that that's the area that's new to you. That's the area that just by its na nature you don't have that level of skill in because you're having to bring in the sort of external people to support. So, so yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Andrew? Yes, I take, I take that on board. One, one of the things that we have done over time is to move away from, shall we say, the core financial systems because a lot of those systems are providing substantial assurance year on year. So one of the things that I have done with the plan is tailor those on the core financial systems, for example, that we've just got the four areas covered. Um, other authorities might have six, seven or eight areas within those core financial systems. But I take on board comments and I can have a look at the plan and make the adjustments. One of the things that we, we are having a look at uh, as part of the plan was around project management and, and the and the process in place um, operated by the authority and also we are we we do have time in there for around co for contracts and investment as well but again i can have a look at the the plan and obviously look at the number of days and make the adjustments to include more more capital work on that on that side of things yes that uh, chair if i may i think it's positive to hear that back and i think one of my concerns is yes the numbers are big but also we're often doing it through a third party, so through a consulting group. And however good these groups are, you know, it's not quite the same as having somebody you already have trained to council systems. Um, and so I'd, I would just urge committee to agree that perhaps we add an additional recommendation that the um, number of days allocated to monitoring capital um, programs be reviewed and and you know, reported back at the next meeting just not you know what I mean we, we deal with professionals in this committee and in others as well you know it's not saying that I'm cleverer than Andrew in coming up with this plan but I'm just listening to what I'm hearing the risks are and if someone says you're more likely to fall over in a puddle then I'm asking have we got our wellies that's 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 the kind of point I'm trying to make Michelle? Thanks. Um, yeah, so can I just ask an idiot question? <laughs> um, where we've got um, kind of proposed quarter, so we've got kind of quarter one, two, three, is it literally, are those, for a saying, say, 10 days planned in quarter two, going to be used in quarter two? Or is it spread evenly? That, and there's a second question, but I'll start with that one. That'll help. <laughs> No, we, we, we try to give an indicative time frame for, for management effectively on the quarter that we're actually going to be looking at that, re that review. Where we've got, for example, um, ICT, for example, on the web portals, I know we've got quarter two to quarter four on, within the plan, for example. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be doing work all the way through quarter two to quarter four. Basically, what I need to do is take, once the plan is approved, I need to go back to our, because our ICT audit services are provided by a contractor, and then agree with them when they're going to time those audits. Now, one of the things that we, we're trying to aim to do is bring those ICT audits in earlier within the year on 
quarter two, for example. But again, at the moment, I haven't been able to get a definitive time scale for that. That's the reason why that's down as quarter two, quarter four. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, so yeah, just to kind of go on to that then. Um, a, is it possible to actually get an update at the end of, say, quarter one and actually, let's say, what the correlated, if it was 10 days planned on something, was it 10 days, was it 12, was it three, etc. just to give us, because again, it's to me, whilst it's your area of expertise, to me, I've got no idea, and I'm sure the rest of the committee have got no idea, is it thinking in the air, we'll just put 10 down and it might be two, as an example, because you'll know an awful lot more than we will, but we need to be experts as much as possible, um, or at least informed idiots rather than <laughs> experts. Um, and the second question was the, um, or the second part of the question was the climate change area where we've got about quarter one. I know certain members of the committee that we've spoken outside of this meeting, should we say, in, as a general interest in climate change. I've got some concerns that we haven't really done a huge amount in the last 12 months or since climate change was first raised and we declared a climate change emergency, which I know Councillor Ford would be able to probably tell me exactly when it was. It's, it was long before I got pregnant, so I know it's a long time ago. Um, and actually, from that perspective, it's all in quarter one, and I'm pretty confident we've got an awful lot more to do across the rest of the year. So I'd like to see more on that going forward, say, are we actually... Um, moving forward with it and if so how thank you councillor in relation to the number of days those those basically I've worked that out through looking at the audit audit programs that we actually deliver to actually deliver those, those audits so those, those days are what I'm expecting for delivery on that in relation to sort of the second, the second part of the first question, um, I do provide a quarterly update to the committee around audit plan completion in relation, but that is effectively how many audits we've completed during that, effectively during that quarter. Um, if during the year that there are any changes to the audit plan, then I would bring those to Audit and Governance Committee for review and update, especially if there were significant material changes. So if we were in a position where, for, for example, an audit was set for delivery for 10 days and we only we could only do work for two days for example but then we would actually then bring in another another audit to actually cover though those eight days so so effectively that would be reported through if there are material changes effectively on that moving on to the second part of the question in relation to climate change it's something that I'm, I'm very much aware of that as a council we are at the very early stages and I think one of the, one of the areas that I wanted to sort of bring a sort of an audit view over was first of all effectively are we where we say we are and also what is the planned approach going forward and, and again making sure that there is a programme to actually deliver that climate change project as well. Um, and again, that's where I'm sort of thinking around the quarter one side of things, because to be honest, what, what I wanted to do with, with climate change was to get in earlier rather than later um, to provide sort of an audit oversight through that process. That's really helpful. So I think that, that would help members to know where we are um, and to hold people to account ourselves to account as well to say are we doing enough so thank you that's brilliant thanks Angie Simon thank you chair um can I echo the point Councillor Cook was making about the lack of progress I raised this at a previous scrutiny I don't think we have actually got a huge amount for you to audit at this stage um, because, in fact, what, what raised the query at a previous scrutiny was that, yet again, because of market circumstances, etc., etc., et we had not invested in green this or green that, um, and, in fact, we hadn't started. So I think what Council Cook has perhaps highlighted, I would disagree in the sense of the, the number of audit days, because actually, having been on this year, we do get regular updates on that, but that's just because you're 
coming in and that you're challenging that that question. Um, I'm not sure how many of my colleagues feel that they're um, idiots, but we'll 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 let let you run with that one. Um, but um, from from practical point of view, I I would struggle to understand what we as a council have done. That is green in that sort of jargonistic sense, just shorthand. That you could then go and say, well, actually, we have audited this. And I think what then would I would suggest is that if you're looking at rebalancing the program, you could push that back and have more to actually look at and juggle with something else first. That would that would be a suggestion because I think it's a valid point. Uh, so uh, at this point, I'd say that I agree with Councillor Cook, and that will cause some amusement on the benches around me, I'm sure. Thank you. I'll take that. I'll take that on board and make the adju relevant adjustments. Thank you. It's only a suggestion, Chair, but if if it seems a good one, then you know. We did discuss that. Uh, that was one of my questions, but I'll let you have it. It's all right. Well, if you're going to have these secretive pre-meetings, then you can only expect those of us who come only to the public meetings to. Uh, not give you too much room, Chair. That's what we're here for. I have to be able to understand what I'm talking about before I come to these meetings. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there's some councillors over the years who never got that far. Um, so we've got... Um, are there any further questions? Sorry. No. So we've got a recommendation that the committee comment on and endorse the 22-23 proposed internal audit plan, and we've got Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. We've done that. But, Simon, what was your other... Um, that we look at the number of days allocated to yeah that the, there'd be an additional recommendation that the balance between um, the audit of revenue expenditure and capital expenditure be altered in favor of a greater amount uh, of time devoted to monitoring capital expenditure so if we take the first recommendation so we can we have a mover and oh my laptop's now decided to die great Chair, if members are, are happy, I, I would happily move the, them on block with my additional one and look for a seconder. So we've got two recommendations. Councillor Thurgood's seconding uh, Councillor it. Thurgood has, uh, Simon People has proposed and Councillor Thurgood has seconded. All those in favour? I am a councillor as well. That's, fa that's carried. Thank you very much. Um, and at this point for item for 10, I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Richard Ford so I can get to my next meeting which was already scheduled before my appointment to chairman um thank you everybody for all the work that you've done just in case richard forgets it at the end lynn and mark good luck and i'll see whoever is here when we all come back after may elections and um, thank you very much everyone chair would you be kind enough to give my apologies for the other meeting <laughs> i will do that councillor simon people thank you councillor tina clement Thank you, Councillor Clements. Uh, Going to move swiftly on to item number uh, nine, uh, which uh, appointment of independent member of the Audit Governance Committee. Next steps, or as I'm going to colloquially refer to it, is how Andrew schooled me over email. Um, <laughs> Andrew, over to you. Thank you. I would like to provide an update to so my report previously provided to committee at its February meeting and deferred for consideration to this meeting. In my report, I've outlined the previous decision taken and also included both pros and cons of having an independent member on the committee, together with a roadmap approach. At the last audit and governance meeting, questions were raised in respect to the appointment of an independent member to this committee. I therefore circulated the draft report to both the chair and the vice chair of the committee for comment. Further questions were raised, and I'd like to bring those to your attention in relation to the following. A first question was around the criteria for being able to stand on the committee and one of, one of the questions that I had was whether or not we, we, we could reduce this term down from five years prior to appointment down to three years and I've subsequently been provided information and advice from the council's monitoring officer which outlines the following. The Standards Committee Regulations 2008 stipulates a person may not be appointed as an independent member of a Standards Committee if that person, A, has within the period of five years immediately preceding the date of the appointment been a member or officer of the authority, or B, is a relative or close friend of a member or officer of the authority. 
A person who is an independent member of the Standards Committee of a different relevant authority may be appointed as an independent member of the Standards Committee of an authority unless that person A has within the period of five years immediately preceding the date of appointment been a member or officer of that authority or B is a relative or close friend of a member or officer of that authority. So this pretty, this fairly, fairly mirrors the roadmap approach and the criteria that, that was outlined in, in the original report. With this in mind and the potential requirements under the Localism Act and the Local Government Act, reducing the time, I would suggest, may not be possible in relation to that. A further re a question was asked in relation to being related to or a close friend of any councillor or officer, officer of the council. I'm, and basically, this the question was around, um, obviously, close family should not be permitted, but as unsure as what defines close friend or how we can fully expect any applicants to, to d disclose that to us. Um, my response to Councillor Ford was in relation to, I would suggest that the wording in the format of do you have any relationships that could, could give rise to a conflict of interest would suffice. The independent member would also need to sign up to and agree compliance with the councillor's code of conduct and declare any in interests as appropriate. The last question was in relation to having a for formal connection with any political group. And my again, my response was that we need to ensure that any appointment of an independent member is carried out in a transparent ma manner with respective criteria around their independence. And my response was that I feel that if an independent member was also a member of political party, this may lead to questioning from outside the committee in relation to how independent that individual was. This is also cross-referenced into my first point that I made. Um, again, there was a question raised around the interview panel on the constitution of that inter in interview panel. And I would suggest that we would look for representatives of the Audit and Governance Committee to stand on that recruitment panel. Uh, and that obviously myself as Audit Manager would facilitate the both the recruitment process, but also obviously manage that going, going through. I present for consideration my report and the ro roadmap attached. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, question, comments from councillors? Yeah, councillor people. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regard to this issue of five years in independence, etc., I took a look at the public appointments website to see what they say because I took on board the point that Councillor Thurgood made last time that you know there might be someone who you thought was perfectly good but for some criteria um, couldn't make it. Um, I think there is um, a difference, and I think. I, I differ from you in the sense of a statement about um, whether they have a relationship or, you know, I know interviews for political candidates for, for my party, there's a standard question, is there anything um, that could cause embarrassment to the party, you know, were you to be a candidate? Um, and it's not really robust enough. And I had a look at the Public Appointments Committee um, and I noticed that they say not that you can't have been a member of a political party within five years, but you've actually got to list and explain whatever activity you have undertaken. So that, to my mind, is is what we would want with this relationship business. So if, for example, you know, you, you said, well, I, I, I was, you know, previously living with a member of the council or whatever, then you declare that and the members could decide whether they thought, no, 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 that's that's not too good, um, or, well, actually, they were a political person, but, yeah, we at least know that, and we've judged them separately. I do think that that would be better than saying, make a statement, because since 2012, when the um, Declaration of Interest rules changed, um, there's been a tendency for some people not to declare because they decide that they haven't got a clash of interests. And, and you know, I raised a question at a scrutiny meeting once when the particular county councillors were all voting not to scrutinise the county council. And um, 
I was told, well, yes, but they don't feel they have a conflict of interest, therefore there is no conflict to declare. Well, you know, <laughs> that that really isn't robust, and it certainly doesn't meet the transparency that I think we would want. Um, so personally, I think it it's a case of ask them to state what these what manner of relationships they've had, and if they're seen to be distant, you know. Oh, well, I, once a week I play darts and, you know, I bump into Peter and, you know, you kind of think, well, OK, you've been honest, but frankly, it's not going to affect your opinions in the meeting. Then I think that's what we want rather than anything else. The other question I'd have, if I may, Chair, is representatives of the committee being part of the interview process. Um, we as councillors, a little while left, um, we as councillors employ the chief exec and the chief exec employs everyone else so we only take part in the selection of the chief exec i don't know whether we can take part in the selection of the independent member <laughs> without creating a political import into the choice of, of the member so i i'm i'm I, I'm welcome the idea that you think we could i'm i'm just asking the question you know if let, let's say two members of the controlling group whatever controlling group that is take part in the interview are they then judged to have picked somebody who won't sink their teeth into too much um it, where does where do we draw the line is it better to say that i don't know you, yourself obviously is a professional involved and the external auditors or something do that process rather than members because to a certain extent, the person appointed may be criticising members, or at least, you know, not necessarily individually, but maybe challenging, shall we say, members. Thank you. Yeah, obviously, yeah, I, I can I take your comments on board, councillor, in, in respect of, of having that robust statement, etc., and I'll take that back and feed that into the process. Um, in relation to that and obviously I w I'll take away your comments in relation to the constitution of any recruitment board that we would have in respect of that check through and confirm exactly what we can do uh, and then obviously report back uh, yeah Andrew would you be able to circulate that when you've had a look to uh, all members please yeah. thank you uh, councillor cook thank you I'm I know I haven't been party to, shall we say, the conversations that have happened about this. So, again, potentially a slightly historic question, but am I assuming correctly that the independent member we would appoint because they have some sort of expertise within the committee structure and they've got something to add, so to speak, from that perspective? And I'm taking nods <laughs> that that is correct. Yeah, okay, that's good. Um, so that... That answers the first question so in which case um it's just on the kind of criteria of what we're saying people should or shouldn't have in terms of shall we say being a councillor or an officer or being a previous kind of member in the last five years well that's easy to check and to balance likewise if someone is bankrupt or something similar there's a register there's a public record of it so there is it's an easy way to check it in terms of the political affiliation with a political for or formal kind of thing, there's no public register of who's a member of a political party. So uh, to a certain extent, we're, we'd be relying on somebody being honest in in that, and actually there's no way of not to all be able to find that out unless they publicly declare it. In the same way as if you're a police officer, you've got to be impartial, but you can still be a member of a political party. So I think from a personal perspective we would have as a council no way of checking whether or not that's correct and we might be able to potentially stop somebody <laughs> doing something who then just go and join the next day or something similar so I, my my kind of personal view on that would be saying if somebody wants to be a member of a political party that's fine because that's everyone's right to do so however if you stand for a council or you become a formal I'm going to say like an officer of, I know each different political party is different, but for example, if you put your name forward to be a member of that association or something similar, you're then publicly declaring your interest rather than just being a member, 
that's a way of actually saying we wouldn't accept you in that circumstance but if you happen to want to spend your x pound a, a year to be a member and you do not publicly declare it i.e you're not on all the different political party photo shoots or something similar then absolutely that's fine but if you lived in hypothetically regionally and <laughs> You, what you do in your own kind of environment is absolutely fine because if you're an expert in your field I don't care what you do outside if you do it within this borough that's different would be my personal view Andrew any thoughts on that please um, in, in relation to the first point um, in relation to the skills that we'd be we'd be looking for in relation to an independent member again this was discussed at the last committee in relation to that and it was around sort of having the I suppose the financial acumen acumen in, in relation to bring bring that um, from from that side of things on the second point in relation to obviously uh, sort of declarations and and things like and things like that then obviously from that side of things we're then relying on any declarations that 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 person makes at that p that particular point in time um, but again I refer to my other point in relation to complying with code of conduct and declaring interests etc um, and again they would be bound by the by that as being an independent member um, but I take your point in relation to that and I think sort of councillor people's suggestion in relation to listing out as part of the application process shall we say of involvement gives gives a view that obviously the the panel could take in relation to that um, so I think I think sort of going forward those those are the areas that we we would look at but there's nothing I suppose potentially apart from declarations of interest etc and things like that uh, there's nothing somebody for example not being a member of a political party being appointed and then following following day joining a political party and you're quite right that we wouldn't necessarily know about that but then from from my perspective I would be I'd be expecting them to then declare that as because they are an independent member and I think I think the the other side as as I related um, earlier in in my report is having that independent member that we've got the transparency of process within the committee um, and I think that's where I, th I would suggest that it's almost asking that question of what would somebody from outside looking in say in relation to that independent member and the questioning of that that sort of that independent member and the process you got a quick follow-up, Michelle, yeah? Yes, yeah, um, I think just to kind of come on that, completely agree from a transparency perspective. We want people to look at it and go, actually, there's a value of doing this, especially the fact it's a remunerated position. I think there has to be, we're spending public money at the end of the day. So I completely agree with that. I think it's just a case of us saying we don't necessarily put someone off applying who's an expert in their field to add value for something that we cannot check. So my personal view on that would be that we say if you are if you do have a formal kind of um affiliation with a particular group or individual then that's absolutely fine as long as you declare it but if we believe that it is then detrimental or a conflict of interest then we have the right to challenge that rather than automatically exclude and potentially lose the right person just because because yeah, for something we cannot check. Whereas obviously, if someone's declared bankrupt the next day, that would automatically preclude them from being able to hold that position. Andrew, anything you want to add, and then I'll come to Simon. Yeah. No, I'll I'll take that away and have have a look at that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Andrew. What I'm thinking is that on this committee, we're looking at the activities of the uh, of the council and that really you need somebody that understands what's going on that is impartial in terms of affiliation um, but having said that what councillor cook has said about providing they declare the affiliation if there is one 
is there any way of actually moulding the the appointments of the um, of the auditor, the independent um, sorry, independent committee member, so that if they suddenly start going down a particular track, which is obviously a, a political um, one, that we can actually um, say that if they do that, that they're actually contravening the contract that we're appointing them under. Yes, I'll, again, I think I think part part of that um, is in relation to should we say the the control of the committee through the through the chair um, in relation to if if an independent member is going down a, a a political political route or is showing um, polit political bias in relation to sort of that that decision going going forward um, again that's also something that obviously we'd have a look at within the recruitment process of asking the questions around how how what their thought processes are in relation to what their expectations around the role are going to be i know i know that people can can obviously train for interviews and recruitment panels and things like that but again i think i think these are the these are the areas that we would we would probe as part of the as part of the recruitment process um, I, and again i think i think part of that sort of contract shall we say with obviously being an independent member on on the on the audit and governance committee again would there would be those expectations that they are an independent person to bring to bring that I'm not saying that that you don't scrutinize what happens within the audit and governance committee but also for them to scrutinize and to bring a third party view um, even though they may they may be of a situation where they are um, should we say have previous experience of councils for example or or, or whatever if if obviously within within the within the criteria for appointment thank you andrew thank you chair um <clears throat> just to pick up on the point councillor cook made earlier on about um you know the hypothetical person from rugely and we can't check um, I can assure you the first thing I'd do if a name was floated by me was to float it past my colleagues in Rugeley. You'd do the same um, <laughs> and check. <laughs> and as soon as they appeared on someone's leaflet, then that would be it, wouldn't it? We, we would uh, we'd know. And certainly within Tamworth, I, I doubt anybody could come forward who the parties in Tamworth would not know to have been closely linked at one point or another with one or other group so i think i think that bit of it's not too in the modern world of facebook and everything else it's pretty easy to spot if somebody's is is not really independent so i think from that point of view if you go ahead with the process the main thing is that they're upfront and honest and if you decide that the criteria can still be achieved then then that's fine um, but I do think the, the one query you are going to have is <clears throat> if they query something, is it political or is it just because they don't think it's being well managed? And I think there would have to be some criteria in there to avoid, you know, saying, well, they've caused trouble at the meeting, so <laughs> we don't want them anymore, when actually them causing trouble might be the very good reason why they're there in the first place. So it's just a balance. But... As long as they're up front and make a declaration, if someone comes to you and says, I haven't been involved with anybody for five years, and then it comes to light they have, well, then they've lied on their application and, and they're out. And that's that's a very basic bit of legal stuff that I think we'd be okay with. I, my only caution, which I expressed last time, is if they're an accountant, which, let's face it, is probably what they will be, don't always wait for them to ask the question and if they say it's fine it's fine because you could for example take that early one you could have taken the view the audit plan's fine it meets all the criteria there's no issues but when I said would you think about the rebalancing you said well it's a fair point so I'll, I'll look at it and I think that's the thing members can't abdicate because when I sat on the West Midlands scrutiny panel and we had an independent chair there which was quite interesting to have an independent chair and that was a legal requirement they were very very well qualified accountant with loads of experience in local government but it was really important that members didn't say well let's just 
yeah, if the chair says this one's all right, it's all right. However, item three, there's a bit of a query the chair has got. Mm. Therefore, we all go, you know what I mean? You've got to avoid that abdication, mental abdication, because you've still got to come here and ask questions as rate paying members of the public who have an elected office. As long as you do that, the independent member adds value rather than just takes away the point of having us. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, I completely agree with that, Councillor People. And I think this goes back to what my idea's kind of guide in the earlier question was, I'm fully happy to admit I'm not a financial expert. My dad will tell you <laughs> the finance <laughs> questions that I will ask. Um, so it's not my area of expertise. So I do ask those questions sometimes as that uninformed individual and going, well, that doesn't make sense, please answer it. Whereas I would expect an independent member who has that area of expertise to go, actually, I understand this and I know when you're <laughs> maybe not telling us it in the quite the same way, potentially. Um, so yeah, completely agree on that. But my two, it's just, again, technical points um, in terms of that list. Um, the first one where we've got be a councillor or officer of the council or have been so in the previous five years or be related or a close friend of any council or officer of the council, can we also add our auditors as well to that? So I'm just thinking, because again, you could be best friends with the auditors and... <laughs> Well, you certainly shouldn't have someone who's been part of the exactly, inter or yeah. external audit team during yeah. that previous time. I think it's just, again, as a point of, from a transparency. Um, and it's you and me both out, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not allowed to come anywhere no, near I this, know, but, so, but, but, <laughs> so but, just but, to be clear. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, but just from a point, for saying so, I don't know, I've, I've never met you guys before, but for saying say one of your brothers or sisters happened to do it, actually that would be a conflict of interest, or it could be a perceived conflict of interest. Um, potentially um, but also the other one and it was just again a technical point where we've got about criminal offence ha um, have been convicted of any offence so I'm just thinking again on that can we just say um, like have an unspent conviction because <laughs> again it's that if you or unless unless there is some sort chair I of think I'd be right in saying all our recruitment is governed by the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act is so that yeah. that would actually, just no, I mean that would meet your hurdle, yeah. that that if it is a spent conviction, it's it's yeah. like you know you can put your driving conviction in an envelope and it can be checked, but it's not part of what goes through. But we're definitely covered by the Rehab Act, so I think, I think that would meet your concern. Yeah, it would. I think it's just from a wording perspective. Can we just kind of clarify that? Um, but that literally was. Um, I'm otherwise fully in support of moving forward with it answer, uh, in answer to those questions. Andrew, um, you've been nodding through and writing stuff down, I've noticing. So, oh, Moira, sorry, please carry on, Moira, and then I'll sum up. Yeah, sorry about that. It says here, have a significant business dealing with the council. So, what's significant and what's insignificant and what would bar them? Because at the end of the day, we don't know what any of your political leanings are, do we? We, we have to take you all at face value. And if we can trust you, why can't we trust an independent person? I think taking, taking the for, first point in relation to significant, um, significant business connections with with the council again that will be more along lines of having contractual arrangements with the with the council whether that's providing services goods services etc from that side from that side of things that would then that would that would invalidate somebody from actually um, um, standing as, a, as an independent member again I think I think part of part of that's that is reviewing what interests that individual has has got um, and again, this goes back to Councillor People's comment in relation to declaring interests, etc. Um, and again, I think I think that's something that that we would have to have a look at as part of that that recruitment recruitment panel. Um, in relation to sort of from, I suppose from from ourselves, I suppose as as officers, we're we're under the undertaking that we've got to be. Or we've got to be apolitical as as officers of the council, um, and and again there are politically restricted posts within the council. Um, nor I, I believe at, at 
uh, senior management team and also other re respected posts within the council. I believe, I think, for example, environmental health manager, um, the regulatory aspects, they normally have to be apolitical and they, they would also not be able to be a member of a political party. Um, and again, from our from an officer's point of view, then we, on an annual basis, declare our interests to um, to HR on a on a regular basis. Um, and if there are any interests that are that do come about, whether that be through secondary employment or other duties that we may undertake, then we do declare them. I, I for example, I'm a, I'm a governor at um, a local primary school, which isn't actually within Tamworth, but is actually in, in well, it is in Staffordshire, uh, it's in East Staffordshire, but I've declared that um, to Andrew Barrett as chief executive, because again, what I don't want to do is colour any decisions that are, that are taken in respect of that. I got Mark and uh, Moira, uh, if you want to come any, any come back. So, Mark, you, you did indicate, didn't you? Yeah, it was just to, um, I suppose, just to talk through, you know, where we are in terms of, um, you know, of independence and, and so on. So, so we, so I work with quite a few councils that have um, uh, independent mem members. So, and invariably, um, I've, I've not seen any form of political behaviour. It can be quite challenging. So, because they they tend to come at it from the point of view of a of a lay person and or, or or a business person, and if they if they don't like it, they 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 go well. Why would you do that? So, but I, I've not seen any um, any political kind of be, be behavior in this, and I, I think it's you know we, we we have our own restrictions in terms of um, of what we're allowed to to do in terms of politics and. Uh, and, and independent. So, so Laurel and I aren't allowed to be affiliated to a to a party. So, uh, so that and that applies to to anybody working for for us. So, you know, so I, and we do make a declaration every, every year. But I, I think there has, you know, if you're going to take someone on as an independent member, you're going to have to have some element of trust that if they sign that declaration, that that's what they mean. Uh, thank you. More anything. Uh, else you want to come back on or is that quite happy with that one cool uh, council people then council Thurgood yeah ju just I think with regard to significant business environment uh, we all know some business people will have a direct relationship I mean I remember interviewing a candidate who didn't understand that owning four pubs in the particular district actually constituted a significant relationship with the local authority um, but but uh, I think it's quite important that we differentiate that between say someone who has a business in the town but who you know, once a year hires a, a market stall from the council at Christmas uh, as opposed to is regularly you know, part of the council's procurement process. Because you have to bear in mind that if they're an independent member of the committee they're going to be um, able to listen to confidential information that would be commercially sensitive otherwise um, and therefore you know, if you imagine that they were sat here now and we then exclude the press and public, and they would still be here. And that's the criteria that I think you have to bear in mind. They can't gain a commercial advantage, and you can't have people saying, oh, well, they're only on there because it means they know what to say when the council bid for this or that. So I think that that's the criteria. Um, but as Mark has said, you know, there are rules around... Um, the way in which people behave and if people have spent a career being an accountant or something like that they usually understand those requirements um, as a solicitor would or, or someone else because they've had to abide by them in order to maintain their professional standing. Councillor Thurgood. Very quickly, um, are we talking about a an annual review of the independent, mem or independent com committee members position or five year or whatever I think uh, Councillor Thurgood in the report it was uh, three years um, yeah the, the, the very top of the box uh, well in the start of the table it's in the very top box I believe um, 
Um, I'm, I did have a very, very quick question that I should have asked probably in, in, in the email regarding that. I'm assuming that's going to be uh, renewable and infinite amount of times. If they're doing a good job, we'll, we'll look to continue them or not limit term limit them. Uh, that that if that effectively would would obviously be be reviewed um, in relation to to that. Um, I would I would suggest that you you would probably potentially would still look to for other other candidates after the end of the after the end of the fixed term period but i don't see that that would stop anybody reapplying effectively but i think i think i would suggest that you would almost i was going to say market test but but actually put put that out because then there may be other candidates who Come in and who don't initially apply, but then in three years' time they may may decide that they do want to apply, and they may they may hold stronger um, or provide stronger benefits as a, as an independent member to the committee. Chair, can I just say on that? I think some of these public bodies where it's legally required do have term limits, for the very reason that it avoids the the, the becoming part of the furniture if you like <laughs> so I, I think you just need to check that but I, I, only I think because it's the difficulty is they're an independent member but if they've been there for three four you actually multiply the risk that they simply drive the committee because the members around them all change uh, incredibly fair point I'm assuming Andrew's going to pick that one up and thank you I'll uh, take that up yes Thank you, Andrew. Councillor Thurgood, I misspoke. It's in the fourth box down on the table uh, on the for the three years. Uh, it's possible that we can actually say that there are If they're not suitable, we have a get-out clause on them. Um, I don't think it says anything on there about that. Below that, it's provision is... Uh, to be made for early termination and extension okay. to avoid lack of in the future. So I'm I'm, I'm quite comfortable that that's, um, that's good. that that's picked up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Any further questions or comments from members, or anything you'd like to add, Andrew? Uh, Andrew has been furiously scribbling notes down throughout this, and um, yeah, I, I'm I get all the confidence he'll come back to all the members very quickly, uh, clarifying all the points they've made. Uh, so I'm not going to edit the recommendation and I'm having to move that we consider and ratify the approach to be taken in, ref um, uh, in respect of appointing an independent member to the committee. Um, I do have another point, but uh, I will look for a second of first. Chair, we've actually raised some quite significant questions about the nature of the declaration. So I'm not sure you could, I could accept it as unamended without some kind of rider to reflect the detailed questioning which we've made and which Andrew has actually taken notice of. So so um, could we have something that says subject to confirmation of the points raised in the meeting? Very happy to accept that amendment to the recommendation of the report. Um, in which case I'm happy to second your moving of it. Or say in that case for the next meeting obviously it might be a different it might be a different committee well it will be a different committee so I'm conscious that somebody at that point may have completely different questions and points but or is there a way of an opportunity of getting that back before the end of the municipal year potentially I don't know but it's yep. I fully support we should do it I think let's actually or is it a subcommittee or something similar to pick it up I don't know um, uh, it's looking at the uh, indicative timetable uh, it was April that we were looking to confirm the the role, um, and then obviously the vacancy to be publicly advertised May, and the, this is the last meeting of the year. So the, I don't think there'd be opportunity to uh, get it back um, before uh, the new uh, well the new council year uh, kicks off. So uh, Andrew uh, will be chair. Can I suggest that if we pass the amended recommendation with the subject to then it should be possible to refine any issues through email through 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 ourselves um so so that we can just ratify the decision because the principle of appointment seems to be agreed the issue is more the 
the process. So can I can I suggest that because, as you say, we've got the municipal year coming up to an end, and whilst I sympathise with Councillor Cook's point, there's a point at which we have to make a decision. And and I, and I think we're all agreed. Let's do it, but let's do it yeah. with those caveats addressed. In that case, I mean, going by it, obviously, I mean, yourself, Councillor Ford, you're in the hot seat at the moment, but between yourself and Councillor Clements, to actually kind of if you're comfortable with what comes back, have yeah, have I am accordingly. more than happy. Uh, I don't want to act on the committee's behalf, and I'm sure Clement, Councillor Clements won't. So I'm going to ask Andrew all the uh, your actions coming off from this. Come back to all members, and if deemed necessary uh, by any members, we could arrange a a Zoom Teams uh, chat. Uh, just to explain some of the points further, um, if that would be agreeable to you, Andrew, and I've got council people with his finger on the buzzer, so I'll go uh, Andrew then. Chair, I was only going to say you won't be able to make the decision on Zoom because of the amendment yeah. to local government regulations. So the decision's got to be met here, but I think the detail of it, we're, we're talking about advertising a post with the details of the job description stroke qualifications being confirmed rather than not wanting to do it. Is, um, have I read the meeting right? Uh, you have. Uh, I was not suggesting we uh, approve the recommendations on, on a team's call, but any... Um, uh, it's just you're young, you see, and you might think you could get away with that in local oh, no, government. No, no, no. You know what local government's like, you know. Um, but no, just do, if, if needed, uh, just to run through uh, selling points with us, uh, if and when needed. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, email to all members to confirm the actions have been taken will suffice. Um, but I'll leave it with your judgment if you want to get uh, booking a, a, a team call with all the members uh, ahead of that. Um, so you did turn your microphone on then, Andrew, do you want to? I was just going to say yes, I'm more than happy to come back to, to committee on uh, committee members with my responses to, to the questions and queries raised. Yes. Thank you, Andrew. And my last point before we take a vote on it um, was, can we have this, it'll probably be covered in the next item, but uh, this come back to update on the process on the next audit, the first audit and governance meeting of the new municipal year. Fantastic, yes. thank you. Will do, Chair. Thank you very much. It's been moved and seconded with a slight recommendation. I hope, Joe, you got the slight amendment. Um, technically, I moved and council people seconded. Are you all good, Joe? Yeah? yeah. Fantastic. All those in favour? Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item number 10. Sorry, uh, can I just interrupt there and say I'm, I'm going to step out at this point um, and leave the meeting. I wasn't actually a member of the committee um, up until tonight, so I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment and vote on the report of what's gone on. So, um, but um, I'm going to use that opportunity to run out and go and carry on as mother care duties. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, everybody, and really enjoyed my first meeting. Hope to be back again next year. Thank you very much, Councillor Cook. Safe travel home. Uh, so, the annual report of the Audit and Governance Committee 2021-22. Andrew. Yes, this is the. And again. I what I've done is I've sent the draft to Councillor Clements and also Councillor Summers as well for comments, and they they've ad, they've added their comments in relation to that to the actual annual report. Um, again, I'd like to highlight um, that the provision of an annual report to Council by the chair of the committee is established best practice and accounts for the performance of this committee. It also evaluates the committee against its terms of reference. I've drawn together the relevant elements of the annual report, and this is included as append Appendix 1. The report outlines the attendance of members of committee together with the themes that have been reviewed during the year and also the elements of assurance obtained. Again, like I've previously stated, I had, had circulated that to Councillor Clements and also Councillor Summers, and your comments on the attached report are requested. I'm more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Andrew. Question, comments on the annual report? Uh, Councillor Thurgood. I'm not sure if you had your hand up or you were saying goodbye to your daughter. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yeah, questions, comments from any members on the annual report? 
obviously we had a change of chair halfway, well, not even halfway, three quarters of the way through uh, the year, and that is why it's obviously gone to Councillor Summers, who, um, I was going to say steered us through the first three quarters of the year, no, steered us through six years um, on this committee, and obviously uh, it will be Councillor Clement who uh, gives the report at a full council meeting, which I believe, I'm going to look at Joe, is going to be June, or there or thereabouts? May or June. Um, so yeah, this is the, the member's opportunity to raise any questions uh, uh, or add any comments they would like to on the annual report. Chad, just to say that I think it reasonably summarises everything that we've done. Um, I just wanted to say that I think people have adopted a very positive approach um, and the fact that we have a confidential item where we can raise matters with the auditors, I think is a very healthy uh, way of going forward. Um, because I think one of the benefits of those is not so much to sort of come out with super surprises, but perhaps to be able to say to them, well, have you looked here or have you looked there? Do you feel totally sure about this area? And, you know, one of the major items we looked at during the year came out of one of those meetings. So I think it's really helpful. And I wish you, want to take the opportunity to wish you all the success going forward. And can I personally say thank you to Andrew because he came in partway through the year. He's had a huge backlog to deal with and to get on top of. And I think we have, during the year, felt not only great respect for him, but felt that that respect is mutual, and I think that's really very positive. So, um, as the head of internal audit, I'd like to congratulate him on his first year with the council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor People. Much appreciated. Uh, yeah. Any other councillors? Any other questions? Comments? Um, obviously, the uh, attendance uh, will be updated um, ahead of any report going to full council and obviously uh, contents from this meeting uh, will be added in um, so I think they're, they're, they're going to be a given before it uh, goes to it gets presented to full council so I will happily move the recommendation um, uh, that the present report of the audit committee 2021-22 be endorsed and presented to council look for a seconder uh, council great works uh, all those in favour thank you very much everybody Uh, item number 11, Audit and Governance uh, Committee timetable. I'm going to hand over to Andrew uh, before opening up to members. I think this was just having a review of the of the committee timetable to actually see whether or not there were any additions. I mean, obviously, we're at, towards the end of the... Oh, there we go. Thank you. Right, so the planned reports for what will be the first audit and governance committee in the new municipal year um, will be a presentation by Grant Thornton in relation to the role of the audit committee um, and also provide audit and governance committee update, um, audit plan and the fee increase letter which will be coming from, from Grant Thornton. Um, we've also got a um, review of the Treasury Management Strategy Statement which will be a report from Stefan as the Executive Director of Finance. Um, and we've got also the RIPA annual report and review of the RIPA policy as well coming. Um, I have my internal audit annual report and also my quarterly update, which, which effectively will, will basically provide an outturn for this current financial year. Um, and also I'll provide an update to committee as I previously indicated around public sector internal audit standards um, and also the quality assurance and improvement program that we, we run as well. Um, they will also be bringing the annual governance statement and code of corporate governance so it's going to be, it's going to be a very heavy committee that, for that, that one. Also the risk management quarterly update and the monitoring officer will also be bringing the councillor code of conduct following the finalisation of the LGA new model code and also review of the constitution and scheme of delegation for officers and also there'll be the review of the financial guidance. So it's going to be a very busy busy meeting for that, for that June um, meeting but whether or not anybody had any comments in relation to the timetable going forward. 
Um, I, I, other than the addition that I requested uh, regarding the uh, the update on the uh, yeah. appointment of the independent, I've got no further yeah. comments. Uh, the first meeting of uh, the year is always a heavy one. Um, so and uh, I think it, the proposed uh, timetable uh, is acceptable. Um, with it, there's only three potential items for the July stroke August meeting. Um, so, uh, uh, would you recommend anything being pushed forward from the September or deferred from the June into one of the summer meetings? Sorry, I, I was going to say that there, a number of those items that have been moved forward into the into the June meeting have actually come from the mark from basically this meeting in relation to Ripper and also the council constitution. And I believe that we need to get the, get certainly the council constitution through um, at that June at that June meeting. And I th and I don't think there's there's any leeway in the timetable as it's outlined. Thank you very much, Andrew. Councillor People. Uh, Chair, just to say that since 2011, when the uh, government gutted the requirements under the Council Code of Conduct, um, if you want to delay it, I don't think it'll make the slightest bit of difference because the Code of Conduct is essentially the same. The Constitution, uh, you can argue one way or the other, the Constitution can only be approved by Council, so presumably it's scheduled for July Council, and they want it through in June, through here. Um, but I, I would always urge that if there are items that aren't particularly important that you can defer them because otherwise you overload one meeting and you don't get real discussion on, you know, you end up with 12 items on the on the meeting which actually none of which get properly discussed because people are going, oh my goodness, um, 12. And, and with regards to the Constitution, Chair, can I just remind people what I said at the last meeting? Maybe there needs to be something taking on point, Councillor Greatrex's point at the last meeting. Maybe there should be something about members allocated to the Audit and Governance Committee be having a minimum period of service so that they've got some familiarity because it, it throwing new members into a committee that involves you actually knowing more than most is, you know, I mean, and, and to be honest, even if you're a qualified accountant or something like that, what you know about accounting outside local government <laughs> may tell you very little if you don't understand how the council works in the first place. So, so I, I just think that you know that's something to bear in mind, and, and I won't have to worry about it in future. Um, but you know, I would question why you don't give new members the opportunity to sit on a policy area, a scrutiny area, and get familiar with something rather than chuck them in to a committee that requires you to have a real sense of the big picture right from day one. And that's, you know, to make good use of councillors and to make councillors feel that they're valued, I think it would improve it. But yeah. as I say, I would defer the um, code of conduct because it won't make any material difference to the way people are required to behave between June and July. Andrew, thoughts on deferring code of conduct? Then I'll come back on uh, council people's other point. I'll 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 take that under advisement in relation to because that's a monitoring officer report. So I'll 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 speak to the monitoring officer about that and 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 see the opinions from from that side. Thank you very much. Um, I'm in agreement with you, council people, regarding your second point about uh, potentially a length of service. Um, if I can give you my commitment that I'll raise it with the chair and speak to the leader of the council and whoever is the leader of the opposition um, following the May election and we'll have well, conversations with uh, myself myself and Councillor Clemens will have conversations with Andrew uh, about that as well uh, but I can give you my assurance that I'll take that as an action from tonight. Thank you Chair. Thoughtful as always. I'll try. Uh, any further questions or comments on the timetable or are we happy to accept it uh, as it is uh, with Andrew looking into potentially deferring the Code of Conduct? Excellent. Item 12, exclusion of press and public. Uh, to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting by passing the following resolution. That in, in accordance with the provisions of the Local Authority Executive Arrangements Meeting and Access to Information England Regulations 2012 and Sections uh, 100A4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined in paragraph 3 of part 1 of Schedule 12A uh, to the Acts 
uh, and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs public interest in disclosing the information to the public. I'm happy to move. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Thurgood. All those in favour? Thank you very much, everybody. I'm just going to give you a minute for the, uh, the recording to end. Uh, if Jody could let us know when, and then we will continue.